What is up, Life Point? How you guys doing? We got a few woots there. That's good. More in this section, not so much up there. Work on it. You guys doing all right? I just want to start this morning. Have you guys ever felt that like something occurs in your life where you just feel like God just loves you so much? So, bless you. So, I feel real bad. I just called somebody out who just sneezed. I feel really bad about that. No offense. Um, but so, my, I'm like thrown now. My wife and I are empty nesters now. So we've got all three of our kids, they're in college. So the offering baskets are going to come back around, and they're going to, just kidding. Just kidding. All three of our kids are in college, so, so we're empty nesters now. And I, I just feel God's lo- loving me so much because he's asked me to send these kids very far away. And for Christmas, he's giving me an IHOP. I'm so excited. <laughs> I mean, an international house of pancakes, he's giving me this. Now I look at my wife, Debbie, and I'm like, hey, hon, you know what would go good with that steak? Some pancakes. <laughs> hey, uh, 18th and, and Broadway, the, that taco truck, you know what would go good with those tacos? Pancakes. That salad you're eating, you know what good with that nasty salad, Debbie? Come on, say it with me. Pancakes. That's right. This is how we're connecting as a congregation. I would like to tell you, that I was going to connect this with the sermon? Nope. <laughs> Not going to happen. I'm just really excited that an IHOP is coming, and I wanted to somehow weave that in to the sermon. Um, if it is your first time here, welcome. We don't always talk about flapjacks, as I used to call them as a kid, but um, we're glad you're here. A lot of the things that we do, we, we do thinking of you. If you've been here before, it sure is good to see you again. We are in our series entitled Rumor Has It. Today in America, if you if you talk to the general public and you, you mention to them about God or faith, a lot of times you just get a shoulder shrug, a little bit of whatever, whatever. I don't know if you've run into that, but most of the time when you talk about faith or Jesus and God, you get that shoulder shrug. But throughout our series, we're talking about five simple truths. We're talking about Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, and God's glory alone. And, and today we get to talk about Christ alone, that claim that Jesus makes that he is the only way to God. Because rumor has it that these five simple truths that I just mentioned provide a core to the Christian faith and life-changing approach to, to faith, life, and God. You guys ready to get started? All right, once upon a time, I've always wanted to start a sermon with once upon a time. It's a big day for me, guys. I hop and once upon a time. It's okay to laugh, right? Once upon a time, there were six blind men, and they lived outside of a village, and one of the villagers came by and said, hey guys, there's an, there's an elephant in the village. Well, they didn't know what an elephant was. They'd obviously never seen an elephant. They'd never been around an elephant. So they said, hey, let's travel into the village and see what this creature, this, this elephant thing is. So they go down into the village and they all walk up and they put their hands on the elephant. The first blind man says, the elephant is like a pillar because he had put his hand on the elephant's leg. The second blind man says, no, 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 the elephant is like a a rope because he had grabbed the elephant's tail. The third blind man said, no, the elephant is like one of those great big hand fans, right? Because he had grabbed the elephant's ear and felt it. Another elephant said, no, 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 this thing is like a wall because he just ran like kind of right into it, right? And had his hands on it. The fifth blind man said, no, no, the elephant is like a a, a tree of a branch because he'd grabbed the trunk. It's like this great big tree branch. No, and the, the sixth blind man, the last one said, no, no, the elephant is like a pipe. You see, he had, he had put his hands on the tusk. And they begin to argue. They begin to argue what this elephant was like. And then a wise man, he comes by and, and he says, hey, what's wrong? Right? They said, hey, we cannot agree what this elephant is like. Each of them told him what they thought the elephant was like, a pillar, a pipe, a tree. The wise man calmly explained, all of you are right. The reason all, every one of you is, is telling a, a different story is because each one of you had touched a different part of the elephant. So actually, the elephant is all of those features you just described. And all the blind men were like, oh, okay, I get it. And they all went away happy. And that's our story. The story, the story of the blind men and the elephant, it's usually told to claim that every person has their own perspective that no one has the whole truth, right? When we disagree with someone, 
We may both be right about whatever part of the truth we see. Hashtag everybody wins. At another level, uh, this story is sometimes told to claim that each religion is partially right, right and therefore partially wrong since each one only has one part of the whole truth. If we want to understand spiritual reality, the reasoning goes, we must learn from all world religions. For the most part, this is the way people approach religion. Every person has their own perspective, and no one has the whole truth. We can all be right, no one is wrong, hashtag everybody wins. Rumor has it that if we want to understand spiritual reality, we must learn from all different types of religion. My wife talks about this thought process as she moved from somewhat of a sheltered life in Kansas to the cultural melting pot of Houston, Texas for medical school. You don't run into many different religions and many different ethnicities growing up in Lansing, Kansas. But when you move to what, what some have referred to as, as the most diverse city in the United States, Houston, man, you run into some stuff. Debbie would talk about these incredible people that she would meet, hardworking, polite, loving, caring people that she met in medical school, people from all over the world with all different systems of belief. And they were the kindest people she'd ever met, and some of them became her best friends. And the claims of Jesus being the only way to God, the claim that we're going to look at today, Christ alone, it began to bother her. Most of us in this room know someone who believes differently than we do. Maybe you're not a follower of Christ this morning and you're surrounded by those people that believe differently than you do. Maybe you're, you're a follower of Christ and you work next to someone who's a Mormon. Nicest guy you, wanna ever, you ever want to meet. Bend over backward for you. Or maybe you've been blessed to meet a, a Hindu, a Buddhist, or maybe e even a Muslim, someone that, that our world tells us to be afraid of. And you know what? Their kids are just like your kids. They have the same problems and the same worries that you have. They're just the nicest people in the world. And, and you walk away thinking, when it all boils down to it, aren't all spiritual paths basically the same? Just with different scenery? Isn't God just at the top of this mountain? And there are all these different paths up to God. All these religions are just different ways up to the same God, the same place. Thinking this way has led some to this approach to spiritual life in our culture that I have called the religion of Chipotle. Now, if you love the restu restaurant Chipotle, that's a good thing, right? Or so I've been told. Chipotle offers a very simple and fun way to eat lunch or dinner, okay? You walk up to the burrito bar. The guy there, he slaps down this, burrito, this tortilla the size of your head. It's not natural, right? And you get to look down at all the food options. There are all these food options, and you decide how to concoct your burrito. The ingredients are all laid out behind the glass, and you design the meal to fit your personal tastes, your personal preferences. Unfortunately, some people take that approach, approach and apply it to their spiritual quest. In our culture, it's temp tempting to think that we can saunter up to the great burrito bar of, religious, of the religious world and say something like this. You got your head-sized tortilla. And so what you're going to do with your religious preferences, you're going to say, I'll take some of that non-denominationalism, right? I, I like their energy, their cultural diversity. I like the regal nature of uh, Roman Catholicism. Add a little bit of that. I, I kind of like that it seems ancient. There's a little mystery there, right? Give me, give me a dash of Hinduism, right? I sure kind of like that open-endedness. You know, I can be reincarnated. I like a little of that. I like the calmness and detachment of Buddhism. Slap a little of that on there, right? I like my alone time. Or wow, Islam, that, you know, that's got a lot of discipline to it. I could use some of that. Let's sprinkle a little of that in my religious burrito. But that judgment stuff, nope, that's too spicy. Keep that stuff out. And that Jesus is the only way to God's salsa, I don't want that. I don't want to limit my options. I don't want that. Please keep that out. We literally choose and pick, often without research, often very subjectively, the things that we think must be true. And as a result, we make our own religion like a self-made burrito. Or maybe you prefer the, the Sharpie version. 
to religion. You're from the Midwest. You're a local, right? You've got lots of experience with church. You've done the VBS thing, the Vacation Bible School. You can recount all the big stories, creation, flood, whale, lion's den, Christmas cross, Easter. You got it, right? You know all the big hits, but some of this other stuff in the Bible, it's time to get that Sharpie out. Some of that stuff I don't like. Give sacrificially. Sorry, it's mine. I earned it. Love your enemies. Sorry, you don't know these people. Right? You come to the book of John, you get to chapter 14, and you read Jesus say, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And you're like, whoa, I don't want that in my burrito. I'm from the Midwest, where everyone is nice, where nice trumps everything else. Right? It is a core value of the Midwest, niceness. Jesus saying he's the only way. Jesus, that ain't nice. Let's just take that Sharpie and scratch that out. All spiritual paths, they must lead to the same place. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it's all basically the same thing, right? I want you to hear this this morning. Christianity declares something else entirely. Christianity declares that there are not many paths up the mountain to God. No, the good news is God came down from the mountain to us to show us who he is, God, as Jesus came to us. Jesus sent to us to lead us to our creator. What makes Christianity unique isn't some moral teaching or some catchy idea. It's that God came down from heaven in the form of Jesus Christ. Of all the claims that Christianity makes, of all that Christianity makes, all the claims, the claim that Jesus is the only way to God, this might be the most offensive claim to the world. To those that don't follow Jesus, the claim that Jesus is the only way to God, this claim, this statement that we're going to look at this morning, it might be the most offensive to those that do not follow Jesus. So let's talk about it this morning. If you have Bibles, please turn to the book of John. We will be in the book of John this morning. The first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I remember when I was new to the Bible and the I went to a stuffy church, so I called him the stuffy pastor, would stand up here and say, please turn to the book of Nahum. That's a real book of the Bible, by the way. And I would be like, I don't, what? I don't know what you're talking about. How do you get there? Right? Here's how I would cheat. Anytime I heard the Old Testament, I'm turning to the left. Anytime I'm I'm going to the the New Testament, I'm turning to the right. And that's the way I would cheat. That's how I learned where things were in the Bible. And we're going to be in the New Testament, to the right for some of you now, And they start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to be in the book of John, starting in chapter 14, verse 1. I want to set this up for you before we we jump into it. Jesus and his disciples, they're having their their Passover meal together. He's he's washing their feet. He's teaching them how to serve others. He tells them that one of them will actually betray him. Jesus says he's going somewhere. And he gives this new commandment to love one another. And that, that these disciples, these guys that he's talking to, they, they, they'll be known for their love. And the disciples are like, wait a second, where are you going, Jesus? That's not a direct translation. But they're like, where, where are you going, Jesus? And that gets us to chapter 14, verse 1. If you grabbed one of the house Bibles, it's going to be on page 901. But as always here at LifePoint, it's going to be on the screen behind me. Picking up in chapter 14, the book of John, starting in verse 1. This is Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it, for, if, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas, this is one of his disciples. Thomas said to him, said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where, you're go- where you are going. How can we know the way? As Jesus promises to prepare a place for his disciples at his father's house, Thomas complains, hey, Jesus, we don't know how to get there. Right? That's that's what he says. And I think this is a picture of of religion in our world today. There are all these paths. There are just all these paths. and, And there's something in us that says, if there's a God, how do I get there? If there's a God, how do I meet him? How do I get there? There's so many paths, so many options. Which way do I go? Let's pick it up in verse 6 because Jesus very quickly responds to Thomas' question. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. A guy asked Jesus how to get, the place, get to the place that Jesus is talking about. Jesus says he's, he's preparing this place. Right? Jesus, this place that Jesus calls his Father's house, where, where Jesus' Father resides. Jesus' his Father is God. In this place where, where God resides, um, most of us, we call that heaven. I, I think Thomas' question at the core is a salvation question. Like I asked Jesus, how do we get to heaven? And Jesus' response? Jesus did not respond, it's love, Thomas. It's love, Thomas. That's how you get there. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus did not respond by saying, serve others. Thomas, you must put others before yourself. That's not what he said. Jesus didn't respond with forgiveness. Forgiveness is the way, Thomas. Nope, Jesus did not say that. Jesus said, I am am the way and if they didn't get it right if they didn't get it he leaves no doubt by following that up with no one comes to the father except through me the disciples got it by the way finally they got it they proclaim the uniqueness of Jesus in salvation one of them says there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved That's a follower of Jesus named Peter when he's being questioned about Jesus. That's his response. He got it. I think sometimes this offends our modern sensibilities. Our world is fine having Jesus take his place among other heroes, among other role models, Jesus alongside others. Our culture admires, they admire Jesus. It's Jesus alone that seems so threatening. The offense of Jesus is his exclusivity. Jesus alone is what we need. Hear me now. His work is sufficient. Not Jesus plus your success. Not Jesus plus your work. Not Jesus plus your reputation. The offense of Christianity to some is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. For many, the idea of salvation not being dependent on our own efforts just seems wrong. We've been raised, and we're from the Midwest, y'all. We've been, we've been raised to believe that success is found through hard work. There's no substitute for hard work, the saying goes. Nothing ever comes that is worth having except as a result of hard work. Hard work, you feel hard it? work. Come on. Hard work, work. We believe it, don't we? Hard work, yeah. work. Oh, I got rhythm, y'all don't know. Hard work. That's what we believe. Right? We love it. It's a Midwest motto. Hard work is hugely respected. I would argue that it's respected over talent. Think of some of your favorite movies. The movie Rocky. Hard work, work. Right? The movie Rudy. Have you ever seen Rudy? Hard work, work. Right? You've got to go see Will Smith's movie, Pursuit of Happiness because it's all about hard work, work, right? Hoosiers, basketball, greatest movie ever, hard work, work. Any military movie you've ever seen, hard work, work. Then along comes Jesus. When it comes to our salvation, it goes, nope. Uh Uh-uh. No matter how hard you work for salvation, nope. You can't do it. because I've done it for you. I am the way, Jesus says, not you. The offense of Christianity to some of us is Jesus plus plus nothing equals everything. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All religions and philosophies, they say, this is the way. Let me show you the way. Only Jesus says, I am the way. Only Jesus offers us a relationship with a loving God, only found through him. Embedded in every other religion or way of life, every other philosophy is some way of our finding God. But Jesus is not just your way to find God. He is God come to find you. 
What makes the gospel offensive to some, actually, it, I think, is, isn't who it keeps out, but actually who it lets in. You see, Jesus came to find you today. He came to find you today. No matter what you bring into this, this place, no matter what you're going through in life, Jesus finds us in a dark and a messy place, like doubt, depression, covered in our sin and shame. But I actually think that the shocking thing of the gospel is not who it excludes, but who it includes. Think of the worst person you could ever imagine. Think of the Hitlers, the Joseph Conies, the murderers, the rapists, the kidnappers. The God of the universe, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, looks upon those people and says, yes, I love those people too. Jesus came for all people. The most shocking thing about the good news of Jesus Christ is that he's available to everyone. Yes, Jesus is the only way to God. The Bible says it. Jesus said it. The earlier followers of Jesus said it. And I'm proclaiming it here at LifePoint some 2,000 years later. And that may sound exclusive to some of you, but I want you to hear the inclusivity of the good news as well. God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die that, so that you can be reconciled to him. You are the reason Jesus came. You are the reason he took that cross upon his back. You are the reason he walked up that hill called Calvary and gave his life. There is only one king. There is no one like Jesus, and there is no one who can do what Jesus does. Some of us have been in church a long, long, long time. Some of us, some of you, you love the songs, you love the series, and I know you love the sermons. That was a joke, by the way. It's okay to laugh. Don't be scared. But sometimes I think we lose sight of why we're here. Sometimes we lose sight of why we're here, why we came in the first place. We lose sight of what we need most, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't work for it. And it's only found in one place, Christ and Christ alone. The question is, what do we do with this? What do we do with this information? And I think it depends on how you walked in here this morning. What you deal, what, how you deal with this, I think, depends on how you came in this morning. Because you're coming at this with a, with a couple viewpoints. You say, maybe you say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I can't get on board with his exclusivity claims. It doesn't line up with what you think love is. It doesn't line up with what you think kindness is. That exclusivity, it doesn't line up with what you think it should be. And my question is, this morning, to you is this. Can you truly follow a man and not believe what he says? Think about that for a minute. Can you truly follow a man and not believe what he says? And to read the words of Jesus this morning, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I don't think Jesus is offering us another option here. Following him and not his words. Friends, hear me this morning. That means you're not a follower at all. Maybe this morning you're not sure about Jesus anyway. Right, and saying that he's the only way, you want to keep your options open, and clearly Jesus ain't having it. Here's what I want to say to you this morning. Only Jesus is Lord, but only you can decide if he'll be Lord of your life. The only way to receive him is to take a risk and say yes. There's no way to prove that only Jesus is Lord until you receive him and give your life to him. The only way to receive him is to take a risk and say yes. Jesus once said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll let him in, he'll love you forever. He already does. My question for you this morning is, will you let him in? He gave his life for you. Will you turn to Jesus this morning? And there are so many of you. I can see it on your faces. There are so many of you that I, I look at here from here on stage with a smile on your face that just says, thank you, Jesus. Just says, thank you, Jesus. You were blind and now you see. You were lost and now you are found. You're all in. You're all good with Jesus and believe him when he says that he is the only way. I want you to hear something this morning. If that's you, I want you to listen up. The tighter that you hold on to the exclusivity of Jesus, the more inclusive your lives should become. Listen to me. 
the more you understand that Jesus is the only way, the more your time should be spent with people that don't look and act like you. Maybe it's time to drop that fourth Bible study and get to know your neighbor. Maybe it's time for you to leave the lunch table at school and sit with someone else. Maybe instead of avoiding that coworker, you seek them out, you let, you let, you let them see Christ in the way that you include them, not exclude them. Friends, the tighter you hold on to the exclusivity of Jesus, as you should, the more inclusive your lives should become. Shortly after Debbie graduated from medical school, she and I were in bed one night. She was reading her Bible and she turned to me, looked me dead in the eye, and she said, you're right. It's a wonderful night for me. It's a big deal when the wife turns and says, you're right. Right, my time had come. It was victory. Yes! I had no idea what she was talking about. But I responded like any husband would. I looked her in those big blue eyes and said, I said, of course I am, dear. Of course I am. She turned and she said, no, no, you're right. Jesus is the only way. Since that moment, I have seen my wife hold the hands of dying people and all she speaks about is Jesus Christ. I have seen her turn, turn her back on more money only to travel to the darkest places in the world to tell others about Jesus. I've watched tears roll down her face as she speaks of friends that simply won't receive the good news of Jesus Christ. I've watched patients leave her practice because when they show up for an appointment, she just can't keep Jesus off her lips. Friends, hear these words this morning. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 